What do you think about AI and um, national policy right now? I mean, everyone is uh, is navigating AI differently. How do you think? Do you think we are prepared for what AI is doing in the world right now? <laughs> That's a very difficult question to answer. Even Sam Altman will struggle. <laughs> <laughs> Fair but enough. I, I mean, I think AI is just going to accelerate progress um, in many ways. Of course, there are risks associated with almost every every type of um, every type of innovation you see that's where my llm comes in yeah <laughs> so there are risks with every type of innovation but i don't think um, our focus should be on the risks is how do we use it to mm. advance our lives but how do we use it to advance healthcare mm. how do we use it to advance um, education and the learning process how do we use it to advance our productivity because really if i can do it in 10 minutes or five minutes, why do I want to do it in two hours? True. So it's how do we begin to incorporate it? But for us now, as AI conversations are being had, I don't think we as Africans are on the table. Hmm. So uh, I actually agree with you. I think the whole AI conversation, we've not contributed. We love us have just been playing around with it. Um, but I think I've certainly seen some movements by certain countries. I think even the current uh, minister for technology, I think he did something yes, around AI, and AI policy, AI policy, and yeah. all. And I think it's quite interesting. Well, what do you think about um, AI and the law? Um, people say AI will replace lawyers. People say it will make the the number of lawyers um, that you need. Mm -hmm. less relevant how have you been able to navigate that and what are you thinking around that because right now we have i don't know how many lawyers we release every year you know from law school and <laughs> a lot of them are coming to think they'll have a career in law do you think this would affect their careers mm -hmm. considering yeah. the kind of space that um um the lawyers play in society now i heard a story mm -hmm. i don't know if you heard that story too, about lawyer in New York, mm. who used chat GPT for his law <laughs> cases. Did you hear? Yeah, it? I saw it. On yeah, <laughs> you know, and eventually, and he kept going back to chat GPT for more proof when the, when the judge was asking, right? Yeah. And eventually, chat GPT brought out cases that never existed. Yeah. You know, quoted cases that never existed for the for, for the judge, you know, until eventually he said, come, what are you giving me like this? You know, and then he found out that chat GPT was just, you know. So, but what do you think about AI and the legal profession? Well, at least you have one example where we will not be replaced. Uh, I mean, but <laughs> but I mean, people say those are learning pangs, right? Oh so. uh, yeah, yeah, those are learning pangs. But really, I don't see um, ChatGPT replacing lawyers. Like I told you earlier, I see lawyers as social doctors. Mm. There's an empathy and emotions lawyers provide to problems, and there is a real time understanding of a situation that you have. That ChatGPT mean so it's very analytical. It's not very practical. Mm. So there is a disconnect a lot of times in terms of the application of what it, what it suggests to the reality of the situation. Mm. And the thing about the law is no two circumstances, no two cases are ever the same. No two scenarios are ever the same. So for me, I don't see um, AI replacing lawyers. But I have a CAI advancing the work lawyers are doing. So you would find more situations where maybe lawyers in IP, because now there are a lot of IP issues as yeah. a result of AI. There's a lot of, so people will now begin to see how do we now protect my intellectual property rights beyond just the realm that we continuously know. Hmm. How do we create another realm of second layered um, protection for my for my IP um, and also in terms of um, when you're given two judgments in terms of an issue as a judge I'm not a judge but I would only assume beyond just the circumstances of the case that are presented there is and there is a human element that is always applicable in whatever situation and in whatever circumstances that we find ourselves for for me or yeah, it's a very welcome development in law. Please, let's have it. Let's have AI that is integrated to advance our work. Let's have AI that, because we already use it anyway. We use tools to do contract assessments. Mm. We use to, we use AI tools to do time, 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 we use technology to do time tracking. Mm. 
Okay. We already use it for maybe even it's the first layer or first base, first base research, but it's mm. not going to give you the exact answer to that situation. But for us also, we also have a code. There are risks. I can't feed confidential information into, yeah. into chat. <laughs> so it doesn't you have to just find a good a good balance but it's not going to go anywhere we just have to adapt to it mm, fair enough but um so that means how should lawyers be approaching ai just see how you can integrate ai into your work um it could be as simple as um doing first baseline research understanding concepts better simplifying things for you better that's that's it that's a that's a starting point. At least making sure, even there are tools like um, Law Pavilion. Okay. It's now integrating AI into the platform. I think it's it's like our it's is the new is the biggest um, online law law report repository. Yeah. At the moment, so by the time they integrate AI into it, the research for cases that will be applicable to whatever I'm researching and I'm working on, it's definitely going to be shortened, mm. which means I'm able to churn in my draft faster. Mm. And obviously save yourself time. Save myself time. Save the client money. Yeah. Hmm? <laughs> Are we saving the client? Okay. We're saving the client money now. The more uh, time yeah, I spend like, yeah. now. So <laughs> <laughs> As in, what I'm saying is that do we want to save the client money? Well, at the end of the day, you want to. You want to add value. You don't want to, you don't want to, you don't want somebody paying a ridiculous amount of money for something mm. that could have been done in a much simpler and easier way. I don't think it's adding real value. Yeah, that's true. But um, I mean, let's leave this complicated side of uh, of technology and law and talk about the business side mm. of, um, of or the, just the business side, really. I mean, you said something about the fact that you are trained to be a lawyer, but you're not trained in the business of law. Mm. How have you navigated the idea of building yourself in the business of law and how do you balance it i know obviously you love the law mm. but also i'm also a creative i run an agency and i also love creativity mm. but sometimes i find it hard you know or i mean earlier in the years i found it hard to leave the creative work and focus on biz dev yeah and then when we come back from biz dev and then jump into the creative, creative work. work so have you been able to navigate that and how what advice do you have for, I mean, growing the firm? Growing the firm. I think at the very early stages um, of the business, you're more of a founder. You're trying to build, you're trying to build something, right? Mm. You're trying to create something in a very nascent stage. As the business continues to advance, you are also expected to, to advance, create systems. So like I always say, systems and processes, bring in other people that have those skills better than you mm. to help your business um to help your business advance that's number one number two as a founder and somebody who is both found owner founder worker just like you are you mm. have to find a balance for me that's what i've done there are days i work on the business and there are days i work in the business mm. so fridays are my work on the business day I don't work in the business. Hmm. So whatever I need to do is just trying to have that balance. Or even if it is on a spectrum of a seven or eight hour work day, hmm. how many hours have I dedicated to working on the business? And how many have I focused on working in the business? So what are, what are the um, greatest business mistakes, or should I say legal mistakes, uh, business mistakes that you've seen a lot of young founders and like within the startup space make um, when building startups? I think a lot of times it's not having founder agreements, like not having shareholder agreements that outlines each person's equity in the business, roles and responsibilities. Um, but also beyond even the legal, you know, you only remember you signed a legal document when it's shit gone. hits the fan yeah <laughs> nobody remembers it when everything is going well. well so an important thing i think a lot of founders miss out is ideas especially those that will disrupt whatever space are very exciting but you see alignment of values is critical um 
how you're also going to arrive at the destination. It's still the same destination mm. that you you are all um, going to. You are all going to. But if you're not aligned in terms of what does the journey map look like, mm. it can cause a lot of uh, chaos and. I don't feel as Africans generally we've been taught to just sit down and just talk, speak our hearts out. Somebody's interest may be, oh, I want to be the CEO of the biggest company in Africa. Hmm. And another person's true desire is they don't want to be the CEO of the biggest company. They just want to be able to work and go home. So you see, the day the one is saying, let's do all night in the office. This one is saying, I'd be like, what's, what's the pressure? <laughs> What's the pressure? What's the pressure mm. um, about? So, like alignment of values, having clear rules and responsibility in terms of um, what the founders will be doing, mm. um, and then more recently, especially in the financing space, we've had a lot of people going to market without understanding the licensing regime, and the licensing regime isn't always for the purpose of um, stopping the business from growing. Is for protecting the consumers, me and you. Hmm. So, I mean, you see a lot of tech founders. Well, apparently, it seems like a lot of them don't like, we just think, let's break things. Let's mm. just go make things and mm, break mm, things mm, and mm. figure things out. But yeah. um, we're not really thinking about the reg regulatory requirement Climate. of building those businesses. And um, I mean, it's quite scary. Because at the end of the day, the consumer that is at risk, mm -hmm. you know, because we've seen a lot of up and down mm -hmm. with a lot of startups. I mean, I don't want to name names mm -hmm. or name any situation, but um, how should businesses be protecting themselves right now? Sorry, um, consumers. consumers, yeah. Well, I mean, the innovation is always going to be ahead of the regulation. Always, always, always. Um, but I think a core key thing um, founders should always pay attention to. You're here to provide a service. Your service a market, service either, even if it is a business, and people are relying on you um, on that. So if you put that at the back of your mind, even whatever regulation comes or as your business is mapping out or defining the regulation, then it becomes easier to, to respond to because the reality is the regulation will always mirror what the business is doing and how to mitigate risks for the benefit of not just the consumers or even people that are that are um, beside. But I, I rarely do I see um, companies where that are really you know sort of disrupting the space or challenging status quo that you will find that the regulation exists before before the, the start. Innovation. Yeah. 